if we don't teach our children this, maybe they shouldn't even try to get married. Because if you don't understand this, when you talk about humility or selflessness, this is what we're talking about. It's not about you. Nothing. You're capable of loving. Love yourself. Wrong. You don't have love for yourself. Just like you don't have the power of speech to talk to yourself. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much to our three rabbis who we respect so much for being here today. Rabbi Simon Jacobson, Rabbi Manus Friedman, and Rabbi Shays Taub. Thank you to Amudim for bringing us here today to do this panel. And thank you to my podcast partner, Ida Schottenstein, for doing this together with me. Welcome. And we'd actually like to address the first question to Rabbi Shays Taub. We had you on our podcast to discuss parenting. Our first question we really wanted to ask you about is um, trauma, because first of all, Amudim is has a, is a lot about uh, dealing with trauma, and um, essentially, once we address our own traumas, we are better suited to raise healthy families and live healthier lives, and. Ian and I feel that we are lucky to live in a time when it has become more mainstream to become vulnerable and address traumas. But then at the same time, there is a conflicting notion of stop talking about traumas already because we get stuck in our own traumas. And we want to know how do we address trauma in a way that doesn't involve blaming and um, alienating our loved ones and destroying families, but yet being able to address it in a healthy way where we, we, we can grow as human beings. Before I start, I just want to make a disclaimer that uh, trauma is a, a clinical term. And when I'm speaking, I'm speaking as a rabbi. Those are, my only qualification is I'm a rabbi. I, 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 I want to be careful that no one misunderstands that I'm trying to overstep my boundaries and make any statements that have clinical uh, implications, because that's I'm not a mental health professional. I don't have that training, and so I just want to be very careful. Everyone understands. Um, I'm staying in my lane. Um, so maybe I won't even use the word trauma. I'll just I'll use uh, I'll use a maybe a longer term, which is stuff happens to people that affects them. Uh, a lot of times, this happens during childhood. A lot of times, it happens either with family or around family. And I guess what you're ask I think what you're asking is, um, <laughs> how much did our parents really ruin our lives? <laughs> right, that's basically <laughs> that's it in a nutshell. Really, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and the reality is, nobody emerges from childhood unscathed. We all get a little bit damaged. That's the reality. Some more, some less. But your question was more about like, what to do with that reality in a way, I'm going to rephrase your question because in a way that honors the fact that people have been hurt as children and at the same time that doesn't turn that into a life script where, oh, because of this, now I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm incapable of, of, of living the life I would have lived had that thing never happened to me. Yeah. Basically, That's did it. I get the question? Yes, yeah. you did. Oh, thank God. Okay. So I said I'm answering as a rabbi, and this is a very rabbi answer, and that is the only way to really, to my thinking, to really properly process this truth and honor this truth, but yet to move on from it, is through faith in God, is to look at your life as written by the divine author. Nothing happened to you that wasn't under his domain and his loving wisdom and, and care. And even though a lot of it can even be horrific, and from our perspective, we can't process it, and we're not justifying it, and we're not excusing it, and all the dis standard disclaimers, but for the person himself or herself, I think it's very, very important to realize your parents didn't mess you up. Whatever life you had, whatever childhood you had, whatever experiences you had, that was your journey. Some of it was hurtful. Some of it caused some breakage, which you have to heal from. 
But ultimately, my life is not some imagined ideal life that could have happened, should have happened, if such and such would have never occurred. That, that's, that's not reality. Your life, your perfect story, your perfectly imperfect story is whatever happened with all the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything else. So I really believe that the healthy way to start to process this stuff is for each person to sort of embrace the godliness of their own personal story, to use the real technical Hasidic term, the uh, protest of it, that Hashem is specifically engineering and orchestrated the details of our lives. And when you can start to see the, the divine authorship, I think you can honor the reality of what happened, but also become, uh, become strengthened by it rather than defined by it. Yeah, that, 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 I, that I speaks to me. True. That speaks to me, yes. <laughs> does it speak to you, Ida? It does, embracing a reality. This particular thing that you had set, shared was that, in a nutshell, if someone is going to the, down the chuppah and they feel unsure, then they should probably call it off because call off the, uh, going, calling off the engagement because usually that kind of scenario leads to a difficult or a, um, a lot of trying times in the relationship. So my thought was, first of all, it was refreshing to hear that for somebody who should really call off the engagement. But at the same time, there are many people who will go out and um, date and they're always going to be unsure, no matter who they marry. And there are also some people that you'll hear them say that they went down to the chuppah unsure and then they they became very happy. They have a very happy relationship. So how does one know? How, is, how, does one, how does one use that motivation and dedication in the right way to know that they're marrying the right person if perhaps they are unsure? Well, first of all, there's unsure and there's unsure. Are you unsure about marriage or are you unsure about your spouse? If you're unsure about marriage, you'll get over it, you'll settle down, and you'll be fine. But if there's something about your spouse that you're unsure of, this is going to be trouble. Well, I guess the question is, what is it that you're unsure about? Maybe that's what it is, but sometimes you can be unsure about something, and you evolve, and you, you don't really know yourself what you want. But this is the process. I mean, it, it could happen, right? The process of getting married, the process of dating is eliminating all problems and obstacles. It's a process of elimination. It's not falling in love, it's not becoming impressed. It's removing or discovering that you have no obstacles. There's nothing going to get between you because everything's good. But I just can I pause right there? In life, there are many obstacles. After you're married. Yes. But when you're getting married, you should see no obstacles. Anyone who walks under the chuppah thinking, well, I'll have to handle, or I'll have to tolerate, not a good idea. And don't wait until you're, until you're under the chuppah. To... <laughs> That's the point of going out. The point of dating is to make sure that there is nothing about the other person that disturbs me. And what about if the person doesn't see, oh, I'll have to handle this, or, but it's more like I don't feel that spark? that I want to feel. That, that's negotiable. Could be you're too nervous to feel the spark, you're not close enough, you're still a little awkward with each other. In other words, it's not what you do have that is important, it's what you don't. You don't you're not uncomfortable with each other's presence, you're not uncomfortable with each other's thinking, you're not uncomfortable with each other's looks, there's nothing making me uncomfortable. Does That's this need to be like an ongoing thing? Meaning there's this whole notion of don't make a permanent decision based on a temporary emotion. So let's say one day, you know, someone's feeling like this is the right, this is my Bashar, and then on another day they are having doubts, but then they, they're kind of wishy-washy. Um, does, does the same rule apply? Once you're married? Before. Before. Yeah, there we'll get to be, once you're married. Yeah. <laughs> there should be no doubts before. None. 
Not even when you haven't had wow. coffee yet and you're not having a good day and you're... Okay. Do, you, do you, um, Rabbi Taub, uh, Rabbi, we'll start with Rabbi Jacobson. Do you, um, do you feel the same way? Not necessarily, um, because what happens if it's a trivial thing, you know? Uh, you went on the first date and you liked everything about it, or the second date, but the way when she smiles, there's a certain twitch. And then when you walk into the chuppah, you suddenly remember that twitch. I'm not sure if Rabbi Friedman would say, okay, call it off. Would you? Absolutely. <laughs> That's what I knew it. I knew it. No, no, no. So finally, we yeah. disagree. It, it may be a little too late, yeah. but that shouldn't have happened. See? Yeah, you had said on the podcast, if you don't like a freckle, don't. You said if you don't like the other person's freckles, don't marry Maybe them. Maybe that's why the color covers your face. <laughs> Maybe. You, said, you said what? Maybe that's why the color covers Oh. That's interesting. Shouldn't be any last a minute. Strategy. Strategy. <laughs> last minute a person regrets. says there's something that bothers me about him, but it's so trivial I'm embarrassed. Well, don't be embarrassed. You're trivial. <laughs> trivial things bother you because you're trivial. Yeah, but that person can grow out of. They can. Maybe. Or... It'll bother you more once you're married and stuck Look, with I, this. I don't know if this is the place to debate the issue. I'm sure there's a lot more to be said because the fact is that the Rebbe, for example, was very opposed to people breaking engagements. Even though halakhically and technically it's not as bad as divorce. But the, so we have to discuss why. You know, why is that? Did the and, Rebbe ever write why? My understanding, I don't remember if I saw exact reason, was because in a way it's like you've given your word. So it's not a halachic obligation to stay engaged, but if you start breaking your word, it's a very, uh, disturbs the whole element of trust and stuff like that. And of course the Rebbe didn't want to have also a situation where, where people just, okay, you know what, uh, we were engaged and uh, tomorrow we're not. Um, but it, I think it comes down to case by case. I don't think you can... Um, I mean, I, 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 am, I know Rabbi Freeman quite well. I don't think he's stating a blanket statement. Everything You have to know what you're discussing. Are you stating a blanket statement? What, what I'm saying is, don't let it get to that. I'm not saying when to break off a, uh, an engagement or a marriage. Avoid that. If you know what you're looking for and you know what you, who you are, it won't come to that. Why did you get engaged if this bothers you? By the way, you shared, if you know who you are, and often, I mean, you even shared it on our podcast that you said it's a healthy thing to get married young, like you highly recommend that. Now, when you're really young, you don't necessarily know who you are. Actually, you don't really know who you are. You, truth is, you only really know, get to know who you are once you're married and you're sharing a life with somebody. So how are you meant to know who Maybe you are? Maybe that's not young enough, <laughs> that's why, because you're too old. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Well, you know yourself at the time. Of course, you're going to grow, you're going to mature, but you got to know where you're standing now. The question I would pose is, what do you do with all the people who don't know? And sometimes their priorities are off. That's even right. in the dating process, let's not even talk about going to the chuppah. In the dating process, what they think is important is not really that right. important than other things are. So very often the things that are bothering them shouldn't even bother them. But they are bothering. Them. Right. So what if the conflict is, you know, Rabbi Friedman, you had mentioned it doesn't have to be good for you. It just has to be you um, in a, in when we had spoken about this. And so how do you balance, let's say a person does know this person is for them, but their parents are against it. And the parents are saying, no, this person is not for you. Um, is that considered a grounds for breaking it off? Because that's an obstacle, like the parent not being okay with it. That's a whole nother subject but yeah is that enough so you're saying someone's walking to the chuppah and they remind themselves that their mother right not like the cow is not coming to the wedding <laughs> she's at the wedding but she's not yeah. so happy <laughs> well they, they want to marry this person but the parent is so very they have against to choose you're marrying your mother or your uh, bride right 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 <laughs> right right well, well here the Rebbe's cleave to your wife instruction was parents should not get in the way of a couple that who already decided to get married you can give advice during the process but if they decided they want to marry each other, stay out of the way. Well, this was actually one of our questions in the, today's generation. Children have, have more free reign. We, we, we're, you know, we have a different approach today. We, we're, we're here to fulfill our children's needs. I mean, that's one of the approaches. And that um, we've we got to be more understanding of, the, of them. It's their story, not ours. 
Rabbi Shay Stafford that like, this is not our story, this is their story. At the same time, don't you think sometimes we need some gvura to be, you know, we have to have the chesed, but sometimes we need some discipline to be, and, and to share with our children, this might not be right for you, what you're doing, whether it's marriage or whether it's something else. And how do we go about that? Parents should offer their opinion. Children should seriously consider their parents' opinion before they come to the decision. Once they've made the decision they want to marry each other, you can't, you can't toy with that. Dangerous. In general, Rabbi Taub, um, giving, what do you feel about parents giving opinions to children? In general? Yeah, in general. <sighs> In general, I could make it even more general than parenting. I could make it. I could make it about life. Okay, yeah. In general, and say it's probably not going to be effective to give unsolicited advice ever. So, here's the trick: if you have an opinion that you think might be useful for somebody to hear, the whole trick is to get them interested in coming to you and asking for your for your opinion. So to me, it's not so much about, well, how should you give your opinion to your child? Or to anyone, for that matter. Yeah, it could be to your husband, could be a to husband, your friend. It could be a friend. A sister, a brother. Yeah, your neighbor. <laughs> it's about how do I establish a rapport, a context, within which this person is going to seek out and actually be interested in what I have to say. So... Most of the work of getting our children to actually hear our advice and consider our advice is about building the relationship. <laughs> if your child feels bonded to you, if they trust you, if they respect you, if you spend time with them, it's almost automatic, meaning I don't like to use the word effortless because then people feel guilty and they, they feel like, they judge themselves that it should be completely uh, without any deliberate uh, effort, but almost effortless. I'll say almost. It, it's just natural. It's a natural thing. When, when a parent is bonded to a child, a child is bonded to a parent, it's a natural thing. The parent is more experienced. The parent has been given a job by God <laughs> to parent the child. It's a natural thing. The parent is sharing wisdom. The child is listening to it. But if you have to chase someone down and say, by the way, I'm the parent, you're the child, here's a few things I want to tell you. You already lost. You know, like, imagine somebody, well, you don't have to imagine, like people stand up in the subway and start preaching. How many people are moved by that? <laughs> like, <laughs> you have to attract your audience. That's why at like every Chabad house, what do you do? Come over, have some, have a meal, have some chicken soup, we'll sing a song. And then when everyone's calm and they decide they're safe and they like you, oh, here's the Dvar Torah. 30 seconds, you know, get in, get out. But I've said this many times, and I'll say it again. It's not my original quote. I think it's Teddy Roosevelt, actually. But people don't care what you know until they know that you care. We love that one. We yeah, it and it's a, it's a great one. It's just, <laughs> I think even you shared it too, right? Yeah. It's a, whatever, it's an old quote. Yeah. But the point is, it's true. It's, un, it's unavoidable. You cannot escape this. So to answer your question again, parents giving advice to children. Yeah, great. But that means if your child is 100% certain that you are caring, you are safe, you are trustworthy, then it's going to naturally happen that you're going to be able to give them guidance and input. Sometimes, I mean, you say natural, sometimes it can be tough and you can have a really good relationship with your child because of outside influences, like children with yeah, their friends. Yeah, but, but that's what you're competing with. I, I, I don't want to scare anyone, but when I talk about parents bonding with children, I don't want to say it in a scary way because we should do it just because it's the right thing, not because we're, we're afraid of what could happen if we don't. But fine, let me say it since you brought it up. If you're not the person that your child comes to to share news with, to process events of their life with, to talk about their day with, to just check in about reality, if you're not that person. So there's, there's only 
two other possibilities. One is they don't have anyone in their life like that, which means they're terribly alone, which is a disaster. Or it means they found someone or think they found someone who fills that role, and you don't get to pick who that person is or what values that person has. The healthiest thing is that a parent should be that person. Or at least, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. The parent should be the first person in their child's life who plays that role. And then as your child grows and has a healthy model for what a trustworthy person is, they, God willing, they'll find other people. They'll find a best friend. They'll find, God willing, their spouse. Will, they, they'll have that level of trust in their spouse. Um, but it, it, it's really, it's about the relationship. If there's a connection, then advice and guidance is, is natural. It's, 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 it's easy. And if there is no connection, then you can have all the great speeches in the world. And you can be right. But It's another way of saying last night, Eden and I went to the Ohel, and when we came in, the rebel was talking about when you have a relationship with someone, he was actually talking about our leadership roles. Mm -hmm. And as it's a like the video that plays. Yeah, the video, and, the gem yeah. video. When you come into the Ohel, there's a gem uh -huh. video. It was actually when we came out. When we came out of the Ohel, the rebel was talking about leaders and that the first thing to do is to be kind and have compassion when you're sharing. And after that, you can give rebuke. The translation was rebuke. There you go. So first comes, like you're saying, yeah. the bonding and the connection and the caring, and then you can do it. You're saying if they come to you to ask for it. Is that what you're saying? But there's something about marriage that is a little bit different. Every parent knows that they have a vested personal interest in how their children are going to, what their children are going to be. I want you to be a certain kind of person, so I want you to marry a certain kind of person, but you're not that kind of person. Yeah. So on the parent's part, it's a little selfish. It's what I want. So they have to be careful. Are they giving advice or are they manipulating? Right. So it becomes very like altam voreach. You can't tell a person what they love, what they're comfortable with. They either are or they're not. So there's got to be a little bit of independence or distance where you got to let the kid be who he or she is and not try to make them into your image. So all the great advice, but in marriage, parents and children, I think they're looking for different things. So parents have to be a little uh, cautious on that one. The problem arises when a parent thinks it's not manipulation and they think it's advice. <laughs> right. <laughs> they think it's the best thing for my child and my child doesn't know. And the parent convinces themselves that they're absolutely, they don't even realize that they're imposing. And then when, how do you distinguish when you do see your child doing something that you would disagree with, but the child may have to learn on their own. We're not talking about a five-year-old. We're talking about an adult. And that's why a, a concept of a rav and a mashpia sometimes plays a role that a parent cannot play because a parent is too close for comfort. Just throw, since we're in the topic, just throwing in another uh, qualification. I mean, the Rebbe says there has to be hamshachas halev. It's not good if there isn't. But when there is, you got to respect it. That you Can you translate hamshachas halev? Uh, an attraction. Uh, Drawn. Once that attraction is there, you can't argue with it. You can't say it's a good idea, not a good idea. It's not an idea. Well, you said there's a difference between attraction and infatuation. Yeah. Maybe you can define for us, because you have your book, Creating a Life That Matters. Maybe you can share with us the difference and what love is. Ooh. <laughs> or what love is not. <laughs> yes. What love is and what, what, what it's good for, what it's not good what for. What is love? <laughs> yeah. I think a more important word than love, which is overused and, and lost all meaning by now, vulnerability, right? I, it, somebody mentioned, we already talked about vulnerability. The purpose for marriage, which I think everybody should know before they get married, the purpose of marriage is to not be alone, right? That's what it says. God says, I'm going to create you a helpmate because it's not good to be alone. What's not good about it? What's wrong with being alone? If you're, if you're self-sufficient, 
Why not be alone? It's much easier. <laughs> I joke about this, but Torah says it's not good to be alone. Every human being in the world says, leave me alone. <laughs> so is it good or is it not good? <laughs> Vulnerability means I am not enough. It doesn't mean I can be hurt. That's the weakness of vulnerability. The beauty of vulnerability is I am not enough. I am self-sufficient. I can do well by myself. I don't need any help, but I am not enough. That is the ultimate vulnerability. And that's what it means. It's not good to be alone. Because being alone is not enough, no matter how perfect you are. I mean, God himself doesn't want to be alone, no matter how perfect he is. Because goodness begins when there is someone else. So being perfect, self-sufficient, all, all, all mighty, all powerful, that's functional. There's nothing good about it. Where's goodness? Goodness begins when there's somebody else. And that's because we were not created for ourselves. If we don't teach our children this, Maybe they shouldn't even try to get married. Because if you don't understand this, when you talk about bittle or humility or selflessness, this is what we're talking about. It's not about you. Nothing. You have love. You're capable of loving. What does pop psychology say? Love yourself. Wrong. Love, you don't have love for yourself. Just like you don't have the power of speech and communication to talk to yourself. It's not for you. Whatever you have is not for you. We have to teach children this at a very young age. And by example. I mean, it could be a slippery slope. Because then you have, uh, you know, codependency, which can often result in, you know, behaviors that can undermine a person's growth. So how do you, it's interesting because there is this whole notion of independence, you know, like togetherness, but also being apart and balancing the two. Um, and then having self-love, I guess it may be a different kind of self-love, more like a humility. So how do you, how do you balance? Self-love is a given. The question is, what's it for? Why do I have self-love? To give it away, not to keep it. Just like these people who are worth $200 billion. What are they supposed to do with that? Keep it? It's, it's ridiculous. It's so obviously not for you, even though it is yours legally, according to Toyota. It's yours. But who says it's for you? You have right. information. What, it's for you? Of course not. So this whole idea that it's not good to be alone means it's not good to live for you. It's not a life. It's just an existence. Life begins when there's someone else. And that's how you define love. That's how you define marriage. Right. So that is the ultimate vulnerability. Now, it would be nice if the person you're married to is a little lovable, <laughs> it wouldn't hurt. When, it wouldn't hurt. Yeah. Makes it a little smoother, a little more. But the main thing is you can't be alone because you're not enough for yourself. If you feel like you're enough, don't marry anybody. Don't impose yourself on somebody else. You can live with another person when you feel and know that you're not enough. Then there's room for another person then there is respect for the other person. Love can be very, uh, what is the word, controlling, consuming. You swallow up the other person. Don't let them breathe because you love them so much. Love can be toxic. Vulnerability is never toxic. So you're saying in a relationship, vulnerability is the focus more than love. Yes. And the immediate byproduct of vulnerability 
is respect. The other person is significant to you, not just lovable. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.